Hey, this is Raj Kumar, President and Editor-in-Chief of DevX, here in DevX headquarters in Washington, D.C. And it's really an interesting time in Washington. In fact, uh, my new book has been out just about a week. It's called The Business of Changing the World. And right at the same time it came out, a fantastic new report came out of the Brookings Institution. In fact, that I was interviewed for, along with 93 other people, uh, all about how global development is being disrupted. And I've got the two co-authors of that report here with me, George Inger and Kristen Lord. And we're going to have a conversation just about what is actually happening in global development today that we're using words like disrupted or change in such a dramatic fashion. What is actually going on today? So I'm excited to dig into those things. We're sitting around a little table here that has a copy of my book, that has a copy of the report. Um, and there, are, there you know, aren't two better people better in this town to have this conversation with. So I'm just delighted to have you here. A uh, pleasure to be here, Raj. Thank you very much. And I would say that we couldn't be situated with a better person who's been involved in the center of development, uh, really observing what's going on in development for a good 10 years now with right. DevX, right? Thanks. 10 years? Well, DevX is 19 years old from the very 19 beginning. 19 years old. The very, but we started as a student project. We were a small scale little outfit for a long time. Well, yeah. congrats. That's dis successful disruption. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So what, like, for people listening to this who may, may not have read my book or may not have read your report, what do we mean by disruption? Maybe, Kristen, you can just kind of kick us off with that. Why are we talking, why are we even using the word disruption in a moment like this? So just to start with, we didn't start with a premise that development was being disrupted. I mean, I think George and I would have guessed that it would be, but we didn't start with any premise about what we were going to find from the leaders we interviewed. But in talking to 94 different leaders across NGOs, private sector development contractors, government agencies, U.S. and Western, uh, we quick foundations, we quickly saw this emerge as a theme, that development is being completely transformed. And it's so beyond anything having to do with, say, the Trump administration, which a lot of people in this town, Washington, D.C., are very focused on. Sure. These are trends that were unfolding long before. Um, they involve funding. They involve how we do our work. They involve the diffusion of power, the rise of new actors. Uh, so in, in so many different ways, we just found that development is being turned upside down. And in many ways, that's a very good thing. It's because a lot of uh, countries are, and people are being uh, lifted out of poverty. Mm -hmm. They have new power that they are exercising. There is more pluralistic government uh, around the world. And there, is, uh, there are rising youth populations. I'll say one more thing, then I'll turn it to George. Also, just the proliferation of ways to fund development uh, is also a really promising development, no longer grant-based, aid-based, driven by a few large funders with their own specific methodologies. Um, and then actually, I can't uh, uh, forget one thing, uh, the use of data. Yeah. I think one of the things people were really proud about when we talked to them, and this theme comes up in your book, mm -hmm. is how the development sector has embraced the need to measure results. But also the people we interviewed saw that there's tremendous potential to do much more with that. Absolutely. So we can come back to and that. I perhaps. do want to dig into data more in a minute because there's so much promise with it. But yet, I think especially those of us who work closely in development see some of it is kind of check the box. Look, we have data. We're doing a data thing over here. You know, we're part of that trend. But is it really being used to inform smart decisions? Is it quality data? We're, we're going to get into all of that in the discussion. I just want to tell you one quick story because you made me think of it uh, when you talk about the new funding models, uh, new, new sources of funding that are out there. I remember going to a science fair at MIT probably 12 or 13 years ago now. And it was so inspiring on the one hand. These incredible students, engineering students, developing amazing projects designed for lowest, the lowest resource settings in the world. I remember something for Nicaragua that was for rural health clinics and had kind of like a kit that had everything you needed. And these brilliant students were developing all of this. And I was looking around at the, at the projects on each table and just thinking, none of these are going to make it past the science fair. You know, there's no funding to take an idea to the next stage where maybe it could be commercialized. And that has actually started to change today. Mm -hmm. That's one of the exciting things we see today. Jordan, I'm just curious, what are some of the other things that pop out of you from this report that make you think of the word disruption? Well, I want to drill in on one point that Kristen made. And the big disruption is not something that is being offered by the Western world and being offered by donors. It's really being driven by what's happened to development in developing countries. Yeah. It's the success of development it's the movement of countries into middle income status, the development of world-class talent, so that increasingly middle income, the successful developing countries can now drive their own, own development. 
and the Western world can play a much smaller role than it's played in the past, mainly in sort of high-level technical assistance. But it's also driven by the failure of development. And it's driven by those 15 or 25 countries that are mired in conflict and poverty and fragility. And donors and implementers are coming to understand that we haven't come up with a good, good solution. We don't have a good approach for how to deal with some of this, what I would almost call sustainable fragility right now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of disruption around and a big conversation around how can we improve our approach? How can we take the successful aspects of development, local ownership, uh, uh, evidence-driven development, and apply those principles in fragile situations where you don't have good governance, you don't have the talent, uh, you have a lot of violence. And so the disruption is coming from the success and the failure. I wonder how you see this, because if you take that to its logical conclusion, you know, USAID and the big development donors have for so many years spent most of their money in countries that today are on that positive path, that are middle-income countries or becoming middle-income countries are more stable. And so will that mean that organizations, nonprofits and, and contracting companies, development professionals, whose whole career path used to be working in places that are today no longer in need of so much development assistance or won't get the focus because the money's got to go to the fragile states. Are we going to see kind of a shakeout? Is that part of the disruption? Well, I think the, the big difference is there was the degree of fragility and violence in a lot of the countries that have moved into middle-income countries. Yeah. They, were, they, they, had a more, they, had, they had poverty, they had poor governance, but there was a degree of tranquility and stability in those countries and at least budgeting institutions that you could work with. In some of the countries that are in real fra fragility today, you don't see, you don't see the, it's hard to find the people and the institutions and the organizations in which you can even work with mm -hmm. to try to bring, begin the process of development. Right, just think about countries like, you know, think of East Africa, Kenya, Rwanda, Ethiopia, all countries that still have very high poverty levels, but lots of stability for the most part. And institutions. And strong institutions, governments you can partner with. So development donors seem to like working in those countries. They like to partner there. They like to do... But if you think about the, the number of countries that are facing severe, long-term, maybe sustainable fragility, as you put it, won't the $8 have to go there? And as a result, won't there be fewer $8 for these kinds of countries that I just mentioned? What, what do you think? Well, I'll say two things. I'll, I'll answer your question, and then I also want to get back to your question about how fragility is going to impact the development sector, which yeah. I also think is very interesting. In terms of where aid dollars are going to go, I think it depends on the kind of aid dollars. Um, on one hand, we actually see an explosion of interest in development finance, which is where governments use their money to try and leverage private sector dollars. And we see this, for instance, in the new U.S. International Development Finance Corporation, is that what we're calling it? And then also the Australian very variation of that, the uh, UK variation Canada's of that, got Canada's got yeah. one. And so I think that's a very exciting and positive trend. And I think there's a lot of enthusiasm there on the donor side. Um, I also think we're going to see the large donors being driven towards these very fragile environments that you're talking about. Um, my personal worry, and I think many share this, is that there will be a big gap of development in between those two types of development. Development finance, I'm a huge fan of these mechanisms, but they only fund a certain kind of development. They're more naturally tailored towards infrastructure projects, energy projects, things where there's a um, a, a, something that there's a private sector incentive to invest in. Uh, but what about the kind of more long-term transformational development? What about human development, uh, good governance, rule of law, uh, education, the kinds of things that help uh, these infrastructure projects and investments be successful in the long run and drive economic growth? A little bit worried that we're going to see a carving out uh, of that kind of development. And also what that will mean for the sector is I'm not sure that it's the same kind of talent and the same kind of organizations can serve both of those needs effectively. Working in fragile environments is a certain skill set. It requires a very high overhead to maintain the capacity. 
being able to negotiate deals with private sector players is a different skill set. Um, I think the overhead is going to be a lot lower for development organizations. To me, the idea that you can have these one-size-fits-all development organizations may be something we're going to see sunsetting. I don't know. Right. It sounds good, but it's hard to sustain when you're not serving just one or two yeah. major government donors. When you're serving a much more competitive marketplace of funding, the way I look at it is you might see the USAID's and DFID's of the world reducing their funding in a place like Kenya or Ethiopia or Rwanda, but knowing that the billionaire philanthropists, that crowdfunded or individually funded nonprofits and others start to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. And so maybe a shift in the money, but still there could be money for health and education, different kinds of money with different approaches, different worldviews, and that, talk about disruption, you can see a huge shakeup in the players, the organizations, and how they're structured to do that work. Yeah. And if I could, I'd like to make a very different point about fragility, Please, yeah. too, that I think is also interesting for the whole sector to consider. Um, and, and this isn't a new idea, by the way. I'm cribbing from an article I wrote in Foreign Policy a few years ago called The Fragility Within. Um, and the argument I made in that article was that, you know, aside from a relatively small number of very fragile, very poor countries, most of them mired in conflict, the rest of us in the world, we now all have the same problems. Marginalized populations, persistent youth unemployment, substance abuse, corruption. There may be variations in the degree. Mm -hmm. There may be some variations in the context, but we all now have the same problem set. And so this division between domestic and uh, problems and international problems, developing country problems and developed country problems, that's all a mirage. We all have the same problems now. And so one of the interesting things to consider is how can we take what we have learned in international development and bring it to developed countries? Because we all have pockets of poverty. We all have pockets of inequality and marginalization. And a lot of what has been learned in the development sector, I'm hearing from a number of sources that I've been talking to in the US, is actually in some cases further advanced than people doing essentially development, property reduction, social justice work in a domestic context. And so how could we cross fertilize there? What's the potential for development organizations to do that? And to give just one example, you know, I was just talking with Susan Reichley, the head of IYF, International Youth Foundation. They're doing a third of their work now, I believe, is domestically. Um, and they're working with, say, uh, in Chicago or Texas on youth development. And for me, that's an incredibly exciting development. At IREX, we're experimenting with this, too. And I know a lot of other uh, organizations in the sector are. And that, to, to me, that's actually, we're talking a lot about disruption and how it challenges development organizations. This is actually an opportunity to contribute. It, it's this actually came out in our survey. And a handful of our respondents said, what's the future of development? Is it an irrelevant concept today, given, as Kristen says, the commonality of problems? Um, and then at a conference, we were at a conversation we had last week at Sid. somebody made the point that when she's in, in Africa or Kenya or wherever, she doesn't meet with development experts. She meets with people who are health experts or democracy experts or governance, politics, that there's not this concept of development and development experts in those countries that we think we're serving. Right, it's an artificial construct. It's, it's an, a it's construct here. Country, right? It's a construct here yeah. in the Western world, mm -hmm. not in the developing world. That makes so much sense. And as these countries become middle income, they have their own domestic resources, they have their own domestic talent and national organizations. Why call it development? It's like, you know, we have in the United States, one of the richest countries in the world, we've got a vibrant philanthropy and charity sector. We don't call it development. But can I make a case for some word that is beyond health, education, yeah. civic engagement? Because the problem with those labels is they completely silo solutions. Whereas I think we know in the development world, and I think we also know working domestically, um, like some very interesting work that's being done in Baltimore, that more holistic uh, solutions that treat people like whole people who have health needs and education needs and social so psychosocial needs and employment needs that you know we actually do better in whatever you want to call it, development or otherwise, when we don't just take a piece of it, but we treat people like the, the whole humans that they are. And so is there a way to think holistically and maybe come up with a different word for it? You, you can come up with that, Raj. Well, I, I, tell you, I had a hard time with the book because I, you know, I talk about the aid industry in the book. And the only reason I say that is because there's really no other term that people will connect with and understand. 
not because I like that term. In fact, many people who work in development really don't like the term aid industry. We're not doing aid, right? We're doing development. We're trying to suggest a real partnership with the organizations and countries that we're working with. But the Raj, language eludes us. Talking about your book, you make the distinction in your book. You, you talk about old aid and new aid. And old aid is charity, and new aid is focused on the customer. Um, old aid is, again, charity. Um, new aid is, is results-driven, the evidence. And to what extent do you see this happening? Do you see new aid really taking over, or are these just sort of a few innovative funders and implementers that are pursuing a new aid path? I think in some ways it's still aspirational. You know, most of the development aid that's out there today still is very much focused on an old model of projects, sometimes small-scale projects, sometimes big projects, but very, very organized around, hey, did we spend all the money in the time period we had to spend it? Did we meet the project objectives? Mm -hmm. But I do think there's enough examples, and I put a bunch of them in the book, where development funding, either from governments or from development finance institutions, uh, they're kind of quasi-governmental, working with private sector, or from philanthropies, they're starting to target these sustainable approaches that are results-driven. And the thing that's interesting is once you start moving in that direction, even a little bit, even baby steps, it creates competition because the old ways of doing things suddenly have to measure up against these new ones, which can say, here is the return on investment you get for every dollar. One example is give directly, right? Which mm -hmm. is really controversial in the development sector. They're just giving away money directly, right? And many people who work in development forever say, this is crazy. The money's going to be wasted. What it does, though, at a minimum, is it creates a benchmark. And now if they can say, by just literally handing the money to people, we can see this change in their lives. And we've documented it, and it's, it's, it's rigorous. Then whatever project you've got, a health project, an education, training, whatever, you now have a benchmark. You've got to argue at least. Show us you can do better. Show us you can do better. At mm -hmm. least present a, a logical case for why you can, even if you can't do the data right away because yours isn't going to have a short-term result. You're working on human rights, and it's a 20-year time frame. But at least have a logical case. And I, I see already... To answer your, your question, George, I see already that move toward people having to defend, why is my project structured this way? Why is my program designed in this way? What do I expect to get out of it? That is starting to move, including with the, the more traditional development aid funders. They're demanding that now to a greater degree. So I think the path that we're heading in is clear. I think there's lots of bumps on that road. Uh, one of them is to data, which you brought up before, where I think it's still pretty easy to put a gloss or a sheen over your work and make it look like you're doing new aid, but not actually really be doing it. And there still isn't that much accountability around whether or not the results are. One of the commonalities between what we heard mm -hmm. in your book mm -hmm. and Ann May Chang's Lean Impact right. is the importance of adaptability. The, import, and the importance of implementers having the flexibility to adapt their programs and projects as, as they're playing out. Now, where is the power in that? Where, where does the power rest? The power rests with the funders. Mm -hmm. And both you and Ann May point out that the funders require a prescribed path um, to some unknown objective, rather than identifying the objective and letting implementers have the flexibility and freedom and taking the risk to get there as they want. How do we get to funders to get them to take more risk and to have more flexibility? And Kristen, you deal with funders all the time, and I think you probably do too, mm -hmm. Raj. Well, uh, I think that like most, uh, like the answer to most uh, complicated questions, the answer is it depends. I mean, I know that our experience at IREX is that if we have a really good relationship with a funder and we have good data, uh, one or the other or both, we can often go and say, look, can we persuade you to change your approach or change this other approach, try it this way instead, based on this argument we can make, based on experience, based on data we can show, and often they will come along. I think the hard time to influence that is, I think many of us in the sector are responding to uh, RFAs or RFPs, requests for proposals, requests for agreements from the US government, and there is not a lot of opportunity to shape the, those, you always have to do it at the next stage in the process. Mm -hmm. You know, once you are have essentially won or close to one, that's your chance to push back. 
you know, in a perfect world, I think there would be built into the procurement mechanism an opportunity to, to work on that. And, and I agree, and sometimes, you know, assumption, there are assumptions built in that may not be correct. You know, I remember one particularly embarrassing episode where I rarely read our proposals. I mean, we're a $90 million a year uh, organization. I do not clear every proposal that sure. goes out of the organization. Therefore, we continue to exist as an organization and to function. Um, but there was one I was particularly interested in, had some background in, and I read it, and there was this one assumption about a particular conflict zone that I had some knowledge of, and there was just an egregious statement of blatant, mis uh, you know, it was blatantly untrue, and I couldn't believe that our staff would write something that was so naive, it was so unlike them. So I actually called up and I said, we can't send this in this way, you know, who, why did this person write this? I don't even understand. They're so knowledgeable. And they wrote back, um, Kristen, that thing you're reading is a direct quote from the <laughs> RFP. And I, and I just, it, it really took me back because I thought, um, you know, maybe this was actually written 18 months ago or a year <laughs> ago because the way the procurement process sometimes can be written or somehow slipped through the net. But there wasn't even an opportunity for us to challenge it and be like, oh, excuse me, but you know, here's the data showing that that assumption is just way off base. That is not going to happen. And, you know, conflict zones change fast, so sure. it was understandable. But that was one example where, boy, if we could have gone back and said, can we just rewrite that whole assumption? Because it, it was just, it was empirically false. Um, so well, funny story. You know this from your time on the Hill, that uh, the assumption that we all had in the development community many, many years ago was, well, we're stuck with government procurement sort of the way it is. We need legislation. We need to change the way that, that these agencies can function. But one thing I think we've learned since basically the George W. Bush administration, so the last couple of decades of USAID administrators mm -hmm. have slowly found that within the current rules, yeah. without new rules, within them, you can do a lot of innovative finance stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And that has accelerated now, especially now under Mark Reed. They're doing many more things. There's many more modalities. Yeah. I've heard numbers like there's 80 modalities within the current legislation to, to fund programs in various ways. So there's still a lot of muscle memory, and the, these agencies are still set up around large-scale grants and contracts. But it's hard for me to imagine, given the politics of aid, given the number of fragile countries, given the huge gap between the humanitarian needs and what's actually spent today, hard to imagine that we're going to be able to continue this work without these agencies moving much more of the money into these kind of results-oriented, innovative finance mechanisms, which seem to already exist. So to me, that path is pretty clear. And we know that the old model, where you sort of define the problem, and you define that maybe in the field, maybe in the mission level, maybe back at headquarters, but you might have defined it two years ago, and things change, as you just said in your example, Kristen. But you define the problem, and you define the solution. And then you put it out there and say, who's willing to go do this work? We know that there are real problems with that. There might be cases where it works. There might be good examples, especially in, in health, for example, where you sort of have a direct idea of what's required and it's just about buying the commodities and delivering the service. But there are many examples where that is not the right approach. And so it seems to me obvious we're going to head more and more in this direction. But I don't know what you think. I think the, I think the big roadblock is trust. And when IREX has a relationship with a private funder, it's a relationship that's been built up over a few years, and there's a high level of trust. There's not the same level of trust between the for AID between the Congress and the executive branch. And there's not a level of trust between the aid employees and the inspector general. And the employees are always worried that their decisions are going to be second-guessed by the GAO or the inspector general. And particularly in the last few years, you've got a declining level of trust between the two branches of government, and we've got to restore that trust, like many organizations have with their private funders, if we're going to see the, the government processes change. That's well, one of the reasons in my book I talk about what voter, what responsibilities voters have, because we do have a system that's so risk averse, right? If you work in any of these aid agencies that are, that are government funded, you're kind of constantly looking over your shoulder. What mistake could I possibly make with this thing? And so it does make you not want to be innovative and not want to use these new modalities of funding. But we've somehow got to change the politics on this because it is, it's tying the hands of the very organizations that we have out there trying to do important work for us and for the world.
So I'll put on another hat for a second. I'm on the board of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition, which is a why, and as is George. Actually, say, George is a co-founder of the, the, of the U.S. Like GOC, that. and and that's where faith groups and business groups and uh, Democrats and Republicans and veterans and military leaders and NGOs can all come together and make the high-level case for how aid, as you put it in your book, benefits Americans. I think that's the right level of analysis for engaging because. I think if uh, if that if people buy in at a big level and then trust that the agencies and the Congress can provide the right oversight, we'll have the room. Uh, but I actually think it's a mistake to try and make every dis tiny decision about how we spend in the public sphere. We don't do that in the military. We don't do it in uh, other con forms of foreign policy. So I think, though, that it's incumbent on those of us in the development sector to make the case for, in our case, Americans, you know, what are they getting for their dollar? And um, not just take it as a, 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 a given that there's some benefit. You know, what is the economic benefit to Americans? What is the security benefit? What is the moral value compared with other ways we might spend our money to achieve another moral outcome? Uh, I think there are a lot of good, I think there are a lot of good answers to that, but I think it's been hard to get to a point, um, and, and thanks to George and Liz Schreier for starting USGLC, it's been hard to get to a point where we have the, the data, the way of talking about development that actually speaks directly to those concerns, and I think development sector people are so they do it because they so deeply believe, they can forget that it's, as le it's less obvious to others why it's worth it. I think uh, Kristen just spoke to one of, the, one of the rationales for DevEx and one of the roles that DevEx plays. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. It, it also connects to something I read in your report, which is, I think I get the quote right, something like, there's broad dissatisfaction among the 94 leaders that you interviewed with the short-term project-based development funding model. So it's not even just that the people who are doing the work actually like it and sort of say, well, this is, this is our industry, this is the way it's structured. They don't like it either, the ones who are implementing the project. The people in the aid agencies, they don't like it. They want to have more freedom and, and have a more iterative process. We're just stuck at kind of the political level. I also think it's about conceptualizing what would be a better way. Because probably USAID has the authority to structure, the existing authority to structure development in many more different ways. But I think the, the aid industry, the aid sector, has not actually come up with a better solution that provides the level of accountability and the, fits into the procurement systems. And I'm not suggesting it's an easy task, but that would be a great thing for DevEx. You know, we're talking about all these new mechanisms, but there's still going to be a lot of the quote unquote old development. It may have a new flavor to it, but we're going to be working on some of the same issues. So how could we get out, do some of that same work with the same agencies and implementers, but get out of that project-based framework in a way that satisfies the core concerns that that, that that model actually succeeds in accomplishing. Because there is accountability, there is competition, um, but there's also waste, ineffectiveness. And when I say waste, what I'm talking about is not what the average taxpayer may think. I'm talking about how much money all of these NGOs and contractors spend writing proposals for things they're not going sure. to win. Um, and that knowledge goes nowhere. Um, you know, there are a lot of things we could think about how to reform the existing system, because a lot of that won't go away. Too, so much of the reporting mechanism is about fulfilling donor requirements, as opposed to what you would see in kind of this new aid model, which is not a report that's after the fact, but more like a dashboard where you're seeing real time, what are the results of my project? What's working? What's not? What are the key performance indicators so I can steer my work in a direction of greater effectiveness? It's not really the way we're set up now. So there's so much activity, but it's designed more for meeting requirements of a funder as opposed to actually making the project successful. Right, and it's a very rigid system. You know, one thing I wanted to also throw into the mix yet, because we haven't talked about it yet, but it keeps it keeps touching on it, is I, I think we haven't talked about the role of geopolitics. Yeah. I think, you know, your book is very much steered uh, towards uh, the development impact of aid and how it's succeeding or not succeeding. And, you know, some of the things we've been talking about so far in terms of measuring impact and even the politics, we've been fo focusing on the development impact. But one of the reasons a lot of these 
project areas will still exist, if not the exact configuration of the project, is because geopolitics is resurgent in development. And we definitely saw that in the report. China came up uh, 51 times in the report for comparison. China uh, Poverty came up 14 times. Uh, and I think a concern about China, a resurgent great power influence around the world, and a desire to influence the outcomes of different conflicts or what have you, those will still the interests of the United States government and other governments like the UK and Australia and so on. And that those goals lead to a different kind of quote unquote development or aid is Maybe probably a, a better spot, word. Right? I mean, think of the Cold War. Was it was development aid? Not better always. The Cold War, I, I, yeah, well I'm <laughs> saying not always because sometimes we did very good things in the Cold War. We invested in a whole generation of leaders that sort of rose up and changed things. You know, IREX's history was actually to train those people who were, became the leaders of those new uh, new governments when communism fell. Uh, and I think that there's a lot that we did that was good. We invested in long-term education. We invested in long-term um, science and uh, research and development. And some of that we're not doing now. So I wouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater there and say all of it was bad or all it was good. There were things that were bad. There were things that were good. But one of the things about geopolitics is it does skew development spending, whether for good or for ill, because not every objective of aid is a pure development objective politics and geopolitics play in, and that can be for good or ill, but you know, we can all try and shape it. I just think we have to acknowledge it as a force. During the Cold War, you had real development advances like the Green Revolution mm -hmm. that was kicked off with donor money. But the narrative since the early 90s and the collapse of the Soviet Union, there's been general concurrence that a lot of the aid in the Cold War didn't work and went to prop up dictators uh, for political reasons, and the money was not well spent. Some of it spent badly. Um, concern, I, and, and, and then you, so you, and then you had, a, with that narrative, is the concept that much more of our development assistance is now devoted to real development. But probably half of our foreign aid is driven by foreign policy, not development. And my concern is you'll see a narrative coming out of Afghanistan and Iraq um, and other countries where the, the assistance is driven by foreign policy objectives. And foreign policy drives the aid, but it's supposed to be used for development purposes. But it can't achieve those development purposes given the nature of the environment and the political overlay. And you're going to see a rekindling of the narrative that, well, aid doesn't work. It hasn't brought right. democracy to Afghanistan or to, to Iraq. And we've got to make sure that, that that narrative doesn't happen and people understand the difference between foreign policy assistance and development assistance. And you see this with economists, too, economists who are skeptics of aid, who do these big, broad-based studies and say, look, aid's not working. You know, but sure, most of that aid that we're including in the in the pot here for this analysis was foreign policy driven aid. And I think you know you could have an element of foreign policy that is relatively innocuous, which is foreign policy selecting the countries where right. we want to give exactly. aid. Right. But still the aid within the country when you're going to select projects and design projects is, is addressing actual needs on the ground in that country, not propping up a dictator or creating infrastructure that's unnecessary or that benefits certain regions or certain industries, but isn't part of a broad-based development plan. So I think that is the, the kind of key danger with China, is China has basically said, you know, the SDGs are okay, but that's not really our focus. They've got a very clear foreign policy lens on their focus. You know, the, the Belt and Road Initiative is a trillion dollar initiative, which is basically debt financing for large-scale infrastructure. They've selected their countries as partners for very specific reasons, for their industries, et cetera. And in some ways, the U.S. has sort of responded saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to beat you at your own game, right, with the, with the new Development Finance Corporation, as well as the, our, our allies in other countries, sim a similar idea. We could get back to a, a Cold War scenario where it's not only the selection of the country, but the selection of the kinds of projects and financing are not actually generating real development in the country. I don't, I don't know what you think. No, I mean, I think there's a real risk of that. But I think, you know, the U.S. International Development Finance Corporation is a great example because 
I find it very hard to believe that we would have seen the level of bipartisan support we saw and the passing of that bill uh, recently, the Build Act, if we did not, if there was not the factor of geopolitical competition from China. It's I give China. it, I all give, China. I give it a probability of zero of <laughs> passing without the geopolitical, perceived geopolitical threat from China. Um, so now I think that's what justified the spending and the investment, you know, an estimated 10 times the current budget of OPEC. I think the question now, and perhaps one the development community can help to influence is how will that money get spent? How will it get spent, which I think is to your point, yes, it may be driven by foreign policy considerations. I think that's reasonable. Taxpayers have a right to think that we're advancing American interests uh, with at least some of their taxpayer dollars. But it's a question of how do we use that money well that will serve development purposes. And I think trying to make sure that that happens and there's the pro proper oversight on that question, that I think is going to be the real key. You know, there's another opportunity I see out there and tying some of these threads together. And I see a real opportunity for new aid and for the adaptability that we heard our respondents want so badly in fragile situations. You've got the USIP Task Force on Violence and Fragility. You've got the Fragility Act. You've got the administration and their uh, SAR, their Stabilization Assistance Review, all focused on fragility all accepting the fact that we don't know really how to address it. And for the most part, people saying, particularly the, the task force report and the Fragility Act saying, what's more important, what's most important is how we provide the assistance rather than what it's actually for. And if we could bring broader political support around approaching fragile situations in a flexible, adaptable, innovative way, then maybe that offers the opportunity to take some risk and to put organizations out in the field, support them in what, what they, how they think they might be able to achieve an objective rather than it being pre prescribed. Um, maybe there's an opportunity for new your new aid and what we hear from our Respondents the only in those way situations. To do that, though, really is to make it more multilateral, right? To pull it yes. out of the government. So it's not a bilateral choice about what we're funding, but we're funding a broader humanitarian fund, and then that fund can take some more risk and can work with different kinds of partners and have different modalities. Which is what the USIP report calls for and is in the House version of the Fragility Act. And what we heard when doing the research for the report is that um, many, inter uh, many bilateral aid agencies. Uh, especially in other countries, are putting more of their money into these kinds of multilateral funding mechanisms. Um, and they actually pointed to, one, it's the nature of the problems we're trying to address, like fragility. But the other is, frankly, they're under a lot of polit political pressure to cut back on their own staffs and overhead. And one of the ways to do that is to d put a lot of trust in multilateral funding mechanisms rather than doing everything by themselves. Right, but in many ways that goes against the current political winds. It's very hard to get support for multilateral funding mechanisms. In some ways, there's you know, huge overhead. At, at well, these were non-U.S. organizations, so they sure. they face some of the same pressures at home about um, you know how is our aid our tax dollars being spent on aid, but they probably face less scrutiny on the the concern about multilaterals. Now, how do you think this disruption is actually going to shake out? You know, we, we're talking a lot about what's happening in the real world, right? Which is the rise of China and their mm -hmm. geopolitical strength in a lot of the countries that, that are developing or fragile. We're talking a lot about the growth of fragility, the kind of splitting of two, two kinds of countries, the ones that are on the right path and becoming middle income, and those that are sort of stuck and mired in, in conflict. Um, and then the, the development industry itself, there's more results data, there's more mm -hmm. evidence, there's new modalities for work. How does this thing actually shake out as you look at her, as you, as you spoke to the, to the leaders in this report? What do you think? So I think I'd like to address it from the perspective of individual development organizations, whether private sector contractors or non-governmental non organizations. Um, I think what's going to be really, really interesting is, first of all, nobody knows. Um, and one of the interesting things about the rapport is, is 
how much fragmentation there is in the sector in terms of what people think are the important issues, how they approach it, and how they are going about adapting their own organizations to try to address it. You talk to 94 people at 94 different views. Yeah, it, it, if you actually go, look right? at the data tables in the back, you know, the executive summary in the front highlights the areas of consensus, but the data tables in the back tell the real story, which is this huge long tail where people answered, one or two people answered, uh, gave a particular answer to a question uh, for a very, very long list of people. And I think the interesting thing that is going to happen in the development sector is that it's going to be like a true market. Not everybody is going to choose correctly. And so I think the question is, and then we will all learn who is succeeding, who, who did choose well, what do I do now that I have either chosen well or not made the right choice, what next? I mean, I think that is going to be the true story of the next few years, is how all of these different organizations following their own creative and innovative paths start to actually show some results about what is working. Because there's a lot of experimentation and innovation right now, but not a lot of feedback yet about where the future lies and what's going to work and what you can pay for. And that's one of the tricks of running a development organization. You know, I always put it to our own team. You know, there's the genuine need in the world. There's the place that our organization can genuinely make a difference. And then there are the resources. And what's the point in the Venn diagram where those three things intersect? And I think every development leader is trying to figure that out. You know, there, and, and, and some are going to figure it out correctly and some aren't. So there's going to be some, some, the marketplace is going to sort through who's doing what well. But part of it's going to depend on organizations that figure out how to use technology and data properly. Um, I think you and your book and what we heard, we see a movement towards, towards real-time data um, and real-time feedback. I think organizations that figure out how to get real-time feedback, and it's this feeds into the adaptability, are going to are going to be viewed as as doing things successfully in the right way. Um, what technology uh, facilitates that? I'm not sure, but the organizations that figure that out, they're going to be successful. Do you want to tell our favorite story about the technology answer? <laughs> Go ahead, you start. All right. Well, one of the, the one of the interesting findings of the report is we asked everyone we interviewed, what are the most exciting innovations happening in your organization in the sector that you'd like to share with us? And the number one answer was technology. And then we said, excellent. Would you please specify what type of technology? We had almost as many different answers as people who answered the question. We had 33 different answers. to. We had 34 responses and I think 32 different answers. Correct. And it was everything from uh, drones delivering humanitarian assistance to mobile apps to genetic seed engineering to it was artificial intelligence, robotics, you name it. And so technology is expensive for development organizations. They have to make choices. So if that one answer was any indication of the fragmentation in the sector, I think you, you get pain. You, the, your question about how do we see the sector being disrupted, there's your answer right there. You know, another year the report was about business models. Technology is kind of besides the point in a way. Like if you've got the right business model, the technology isn't expensive, the technology fits right in, right? So a lot of the social entrepreneurs that are out there, technology is at the core of the model that they're building. So it's not an ex additional expense to them. Well, it depends on the technology. Some of the technology's names are quite expensive, but, to, but you're right, some of them are actually quite inexpensive. Right, I think it's a question of what your model. So if your model has been for, a, for very long, for decades, implementing projects in a certain way, and it's and you say, well, how do I bring drones into this? That feels like an added expense, right? You've got to like figure out, what, what am I going to do? Who's going to launch drones? What kind of sensors will they have? What value will they add to the project? It's an add-on. You've got to figure out who's going to pay for it. But if you are like an like organization like Zipline, delivering blood in Rwanda, now expanding to Ghana and other places, you know, drones, in a way, are kind of cheap. They've become a consumer tech product, right? And they're developing their own and you know, design their own. They build them there in Rwanda. But that's a fundamental to their, their model, right? They're getting a return on that investment. And I think that's the really hard question for organizations that have been doing the work they've been doing for a long time is figure out how to tech enable what they're doing that fits within a business model where they might be replying to, to RFPs. And that feeds into a lot of that technology that could be adapted to development is in the private sector. And one thing that we heard was frustration by the NGOs and by the companies 
on how to make that relationship work, how to make collaboration work. Um, and I think the companies that, the, 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 the organizations that do that well are gonna figure out how, how they break that blockage. Um, they're gonna have a more sustainable model on how they implement development. And it kind of feeds into your, your perspective again of, of where new aid is. And it's more focused on the results and that's what the private sector wants to look at. They want to hear that there's going to be a concrete, sustainable result from some relationship. Right. If you're Starbucks, you know, it's become so normal that we don't even think about it. Right? Walk down the street to Starbucks, coffee of the day is from Guatemala or from Rwanda, right? Ethiopia, countries where sometimes more than half the population is living in extreme poverty. The farmers themselves are either at the poverty line or just above it. And we as consumers say, hey, Starbucks, we want really good quality coffee. We want to make sure there was no child labor involved in producing this coffee. We want it to be sustainable for the environment. So Starbucks has got to go out and make sure that their sources and supplies of product meet those kinds of standards. They're basically a development actor, if you think of it in that way. And for them, they need the result. They don't just need the, to be able to say to their customer, we gave a donation to this organization to help us with this. They need to be pretty confident about the quality of what they're getting and the conditions under which they got it. So I think that does start to change the dynamic of the industry into a much more results-oriented one when you have players like that that are working with the partners that we all know here in, in Washington or around the world. There's another obstacle for development organizations too, and this definitely came up in our report. Um, one of the most frequently mentioned concerns across the board, whether from funders, whether from implementers, whether from nonprofit, private, government, you name it, was talent and making sure that you actually have the people who know who can actually evaluate, well, is a drone delivery of those blood supplies gonna be the right approach and how would I actually go about doing that? That is a completely different skill set from someone who has been running, you know, a capacity building pro traditional capacity building project for civil society for USAID. And that doesn't mean they're not both valuable skill sets. It just means you already have one and you don't have the other and you don't even know what to look for, um, let alone how to pay for it. So that I, I was actually really surprised by how common that answer was. I mean, I think we were both surprised at that, and especially that it was not just something for you know nonprofits that are always sort of struggling to find the extra dollar to pay for expertise, but it was really across the entire se uh, sector, including government, multinationals, funders, et cetera. Well, we look at the career path in our industry. For many people, it's been you get into it when you're young, and you really spend your whole career. You might jump from one nonprofit to another development consulting firm, maybe go to government, but you're really within the same kind of track your whole career. And I think where we're heading is we're gonna to need to be able to attract people who come out of totally different sectors, out of technology, out of business, out of finance, who share the mission of development work, who care about these end results we're all trying to achieve, but may not understand any of the lingo that's really common to all of us who've been working in this space for a long time, and may have a very different worldview. Well, a handful of the NGO leaders that we know who've in the last 10 years have cut, are women who've come out of business. I mean, you're already seeing that happening. Yeah, because you need those skills. You mm -hmm. need people who can, who can translate across different sectors, who well, can speak with- Young people come, come ask me, you know, I want, a, I want a career in development. What should, what should I go study? What, what should my graduate program be? I said, go get an MBA. Development is a big business and there are no managers in it. Yeah, and, and you need this technical skills beyond, you kind of need both. You need the technical skills around development disciplines, but you also need technical skills around technology and finance and the kinds of things that are gonna enable the new business models of the future. Yeah, I mean, I think development finance is one, gonna be one of the most immediate talent gaps that a lot of organizations are gonna face. How do you actually play into a, a deal like that? How do you add value? How do you speak that language? I th most people don't have that group of talented individuals on their staff. Yeah, I talk about development impact bonds. You know, they're getting a lot of attention now, but there's only still about 10 of them in the world. Right. But there's a chance that this kind of model could explode, or you'll see similar models, right, that, that really take off. How many people in our industry even know how to describe what a development impact bond is, let alone structure one? It's a very small group of people who have that experience. They're going to be highly sought after. 
And it is a, the, the talent war is going to be a real thing for organizations who need to bring those people on. And I think there are going to be all kinds of board meetings where people say, like, we should be looking into development impact bonds. And then the next day, people in the offerings go, OK, now what? Um, because it's, it's one thing to believe in the mechanism from a philosophical standpoint. It's a completely other thing to turn that into something that your organization is actually doing. Um, and they, people may not have that network of contacts let alone uh, the, the skills on their, uh, on their teams in order to do that. Just to shift gears just a little bit, one of the mm -hmm. kind of controversial issues in our industry right now that I talk about in the book is billionaire philanthropy. I don't know how much that came out in your report or if you have a take on, on that as a new source of funding. Of course, Gates Foundation is on everything. I mean, it's hard to find any new initiative or project where they're not there, but there is potentially a tidal wave of billionaires coming behind them who, you know, some of whom might think they have all the answers, <laughs> Uh, but certainly there's a lot of money there as well. So what's going to happen to well, our industry? Our respondents did not challenge the wealthy philanthropist individuals the way you do in your book. And saying, I mean, you say it's not just good enough for them to have a little charity. They've got, they've got to produce results if we're going to take them seriously. Yep. Our respondents didn't, didn't go there. Um, we didn't ask them that particular question. Um, and they didn't particularly make a big distinction between the nature of the funding. Was it coming from government? Was it coming from foundations or, or, or philanthropists? So I think, I think you, you took what we heard of the uncertainty of funding to a, to a, 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 a judgmental level mm -hmm. that, that we have, that there's funding and there's, there's funding. And just the way I think we sort through government funding is between funding that's there for foreign policy political reasons versus development reasons, and we make a value judgment on which one's more valuable. Uh, you took that to the private sector. I just don't know if we're really ready as an industry for the, the volumes of, of cash that could flow in through billionaire philanthropy. You know, right now it's still the, the challenge is there's not enough, right? That but I tell more... you where we I tell you where it can be used, and that yeah. is to use it like Omidyar and Gates does a little bit in helping to start up social enterprise. And to me, social enterprises are the most interesting new model out there. It's what I call the Sesame Street model. Sesame Street is a nonprofit. It's 80% funded through revenues from commercial products it sells, its programming, its dolls and whatnot. And 20% comes from fundraising. Um, and you see that, you've seen that in the solar industry in Africa, where government funders have, have helped start companies that have a notion, have a vision, have a technology for getting solar electricity out to villages, to poor people, and have a model of, of weekly payment on cell phones. But, the, but it's too risky for the commercial finance to finance. You have the same thing with the, you know, the, the cell phones in Kenya. Um, so I think you'll see some of that philanthropy money going into what I would almost call blended finance, of blending the nonprofit and the four private sectors together uh, where there's a potential uh, long-term commercial model. So I think both your book and another very good new book called Winners Take All touch on this issue and raise a lot of very valid points. But George is correct that the people in our uh, study didn't really mention this issue. And I'm going to venture a hypothesis about why. They did oh, not specify. This, yeah. One of the reasons, I think, is that I think it sounds like a source of hope. Uh, you know, uh, we're hearing about all these cuts and diversions and competition and a lot of NGOs, frankly, and a lot of others in the development sector are worried that the wolf is at the door. You saw all the concerns about business model and relevance in the model. I think the idea that there are all these new funders coming in is a bit of a source of hope. Mm -hmm. um, I think that a lot of uh, development organizations ought to be worried, though, that they will be the right, be seen as the right partners for that kind of philanthropy. I think that a lot of these organizations either may want to do things but for themselves, 
that's a trend, yeah, you know, more operating right. foundations. Um, I think that they may not want to work with the with the more established mm -hmm. organizations. And I think that that may be to some extent to their detriment because there's a lot to learn from organizations that have been working in the sector Absolutely. for a long time. But I think the other thing is it can be a real challenge for development organizations that have been exquisitely trained by USAID to speak their language and conceptualize work in their way um, to pivot and deal with other funders. And, and anyone in the development world who has tried to work with a very different kind of funder, you see that there is a huge learning curve, even when it works. Um, and one of the other findings of the report, by the way, is about how hard partnership is and how hard collaboration is. You know, we always are always talking about it in a very positive way, but you know, with given the, the shield of anonymity, a lot of our respondents talk to you how hard it is to find partners, how hard it is to collaborate with different sectors and so on. And so I think with these new funders, we'll see those challenges again. Um, but I do hope that development organizations will solve those problems and, and adapt. And I also hope that the new funders will take the time to listen from all to all the experience and the learning that's been uh, acquired by these organizations. Yeah, I think that's right. And that's why I think now is the moment we need to, to lay down what are the rules for the road, right? So as billionaire funders are thinking about what they might do with their philanthropy, let's be clear that we expect transparency, that just hiding behind anonymity for at the sizes of funding we're talking about and funding you know, key development issues in developing countries, you kind of have to be public about that and, and what you're funding and why, that there are best practices, that you don't have to go and create this from whole cloth and kind of invent for the first time, maybe even replicating the problems of aid agencies saying, we know the problem and we also know the solution, but instead you know, work with organizations that, that can iterate toward results and that there's gotta be some accountability. It can't, we can't just applaud the announcement of a new funding pledge before anything's been done. When we know from our own history as an, as an industry, so many projects fail, so many initiatives fail, many can even be counterproductive. So I think getting, our, getting the, the rules for the road right are gonna be absolutely critical, especially, and maybe this is a, a good point to just wrap up our conversation on, especially uh, at this moment with so much change and disruption that, that you've identified in this report, talking to so many leaders in the space, this is kind of a moment to shape that future. Right? It's not just that the future is happening to us. I mean, it's not like we're going to change necessarily the geopolitical conflict with China, for example. But a lot of what will be the development industry in the future is going to be determined by the, the people today who can shape that future, just as you, George, worked at USGLC and you now do that at Kristen, like Kristen at USGLC, like figuring out how to create those institutions that we need, create the narratives that we need, set those rules for the road for the next, the next era. I think that's a good, good note to end on because I think you're absolutely right. Agreed. Thank you, Raj. Well, thank you. This is a great topic, and I agree. Disruption is a term we think of from Silicon Valley, but it's it's here in development. I mean, and it and it can be a positive term. It can be, absolutely. Well, thank you yeah. for your report, and thanks for the conversation. Yeah, and thanks for your book.